Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the National Disability Authority, I am delighted to welcome you here today for our annual listening session. The theme this year is Article 8 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability on Awareness Raising. I hold the position of Chairperson of the National Disability Authority. For those of you not familiar with our work, the NDA provide evidence-informed advice across government on disability policy and related matters. Within the NDA, we also have the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, which promotes understanding and adoption of universal design in all aspects of life, including the built environment, products, services, and ICT. Increasing awareness of disability, specifically in the context of rights and equality, is important in influencing attitudes and reducing discrimination. In our work on attitudes, we know that public attitudes to disability are generally positive. Although recent research we commissioned from the ESRI found that some people hide their true attitudes and that support for policies to support disabled people changed as people realized there may be an impact on them through taxes or reduce spending in other sectors of society. We also know from talking to disabled people that the positive attitudes documented in a lot of research is not always felt in their day-to-day -day lives and discrimination remains. New legislation, the Criminal Justice Incitement to Violence or Hatred and Hate Offences Bill is close to being enacted. And we hope that it will provide greater protections to the rights of disabled people in Ireland. We are in a developing space in terms of our legislation and policy. And this listening session is a timely opportunity for you to give your views and share your experiences on how, as a state, we can do better to make society a more inclusive and accepting place for disabled people. I would like to sincerely thank the keynote speakers today. They will speak on their experiences and answer some of your questions on this theme. The breakout sessions will allow you to contribute your lived experiences in this area and we look forward to listening to your contributions. Hearing and understanding the perspectives of disabled people is essential to inform our work and advice to government. And it is also in keeping with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which places meaningful participation at the heart of attaining full societal participation for disabled persons. We will publish a summary of the proceedings and as we have done in previous years, we will share this with the Minister of State for Disabilities and we will use the learnings in our own work and advice to government. We have agreed with the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth to share a summary of today's session with them, which will feed into the new UNCRPD implementation strategy that is to be developed this year. We will note any specific views that are put forward by disabled persons organisations. I hope you have an interesting and productive day, and I wish you all the best in this endeavour. And I will now hand over to Dr. Aideen Hartney, the Director of the NDA, who is going to chair the rest of this session. Thank you very much, Catherine, and a uh, very good afternoon to everybody and a warm welcome to you all. Um, so we're delighted, as Catherine said, to welcome you to this, which uh, is now our third annual listening event. So it is very much becoming part of the NDA calendar. Uh, and um, we're holding this event at lunchtime today. Uh, oh. We're experimenting with having events at different times to see uh, about maximizing participation and facilitating people who might be able to join uh, during a lunch break. Um, so uh, I'm welcoming everybody. We have our participants, speakers, everyone who's organized this, and um, we will have facilitators and note takers joining us later, uh, ISL translators and captioners, and of course the technical support behind the scenes. My job really is to guide you through the format of the session and make sure we keep to time in so far as possible. So the first part of the session is a webinar, which we are in now, and we're going to hear from two speakers who will share their experiences 
and the experiences of their communities in relation to awareness raising, which is our theme for today. Adam Harris, founder and CEO of As I Am, will speak first. And As I Am is Ireland's national autism strategy, charity. Adam founded the organization based on his own experiences growing up as autistic. And following this, Paula Sarahan, community development worker with the Independent Living Movement Ireland will speak. And Paula works to bring disabled people together in collective spaces to build community and empower disabled activists to create social change. After both speakers, we will have some time to put some of your questions to them. As you listen to them, and if a question comes into your mind, you can type that question into the question and answer function, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, depending on how many questions we get, I may only have time for a few of them. So if we don't get to your question during this webinar stage, do hang on to it for the breakout discussion groups, uh, which will come after the break. So as I say, there'll be a short break after the main webinar. And the second part of the session will be a normal Zoom meeting. And when you join that meeting, you will be assigned to a breakout room for discussion. After the co uh, coffee break, use the second Zoom link that you should have received in your email to rejoin. And during those breakout discussions, we would encourage everyone to keep their camera on, uh, if at all possible. Our facilitators will join you in those rooms and they'll have a few questions to get the discussion on awareness raising started. Each room is going to have a note taker and following the discussions, everyone will come back together again uh, for just a few moments so that someone from each room can give a short summary back to the whole group before we wrap up. You have been assigned to breakout rooms and, and should automatically go into them when you use this second Zoom link. But if you don't have one, just give us a few moments and we will assign you behind the scenes. Uh, the webinar host is going to spotlight the speaker and the ISL interpreter, and they're going to appear on the screen all the time. But if you are having any technical difficulties with seeing the interpreter or anything, please do use the messaging function to get in touch with us. So without further ado, I am now going to ask Adam Harris from As I Am to give us his perspectives on the theme of the day. Over to you, Adam. Thank you so much, Aideen, for the introduction and for hosting today's event. Uh, from my perspective, I think it's a very timely discussion, as has been introduced. And I think also it's fair to say that certainly from the perspective of As I Am and many people within the autism community, I think that this issue of awareness raising is so central to the overall rights-based approach that we must embrace and fully move towards, because certainly so many of the barriers experienced in day-to-day -day life come from a lack of understanding, a lack of understanding amongst peers, a lack of understanding amongst the general public, and indeed a lack of understanding amongst services that disabled or autistic people should be able to have parity of access for. From my own perspective, it's also a timely discussion because it's a, at present we have a very large amount of data uh, linked to this team, team as we just come off the back of World Autism Month, and I'll return to that um, in a moment. What I did want to do at the start of the talk was just tackle the term awareness in and of itself. Um, I come from a community that in recent years has really tried to move away from the term awareness raising not move away from the concept that is very clearly and very importantly embedded within the UNCRPD, but rather perhaps move away from what awareness has been in practice, which is sometimes a tick the box, sometimes lots and lots of talk, but not enough action. Indeed, the term that has been growing within our community is the need to move beyond awareness towards acceptance of autistic people. I often say that I'm aware that Mandarin is a language, but it doesn't mean that I can understand or I can empower anybody who only speaks that language. So really, awareness is an important starting point, but it isn't in and of itself a destination. And perhaps too often in policy and in initiatives, it is presented as the destination, whereas it really should only be the starting point. I think just a, a few comments that I would make in terms of the area of awareness raising. I think a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And I think in disability as a whole, that's very much where we're at. People know a little bit. Uh, if we take the term autism and put it into Google, 
it will return 3 billion search results in less than a few seconds. And some of that information is wonderful. And some of that information is quite frankly dangerous. So people's ability to interrogate the information that they're given is really, really important. And for people to have accurate information, and I suppose that comes really to the heart of this idea of bad awareness raising. For example, during World Autism Month, much of the awareness activity that takes place online can be deeply stigmatizing about autistic people it doesn't come from the autism community or doesn't place the voices of autistic people at the center uh, repeatedly uses language or symbols that autistic adults have been very clear are offensive and we need to move beyond so awareness raising as a concept is really really important and i think for the purposes of this conversation i think we can take it but when we talk about awareness raising that our aim is to drive understanding and acceptance. And it's so important that we go about that in the right way. And I suppose in how we approach awareness raising as a team, this is something that I have a lot of views on because as I am is now um, in our 10th year of activity. And for many years, what I felt the work we were doing around trying to educate the public, which is so central to what we do in terms of seeing autism as an accessibility barrier in which attitudinal barriers are central to many of the experiences of autistic people. But I suppose very often when, when we were doing this work, we were spending a lot of time and energy explaining autism. And autism is an incredibly complex thing to explain. People have very short attention spans. The level of knowledge people need around the intric intricacies of autism very much depend on the role in society and on their relationships with autistic people. But what people really need to understand is the barriers autistic people face and what those barriers are and what people can do to remove them. So that has led us in recent times to developing our Same Chance campaign, which is really all about saying autistic people do not have the same chance, but that is all that autistic people want. And here's how we as a community can get there. We live in an era of equality and where people care passionately, I believe, about diversity and inclusion. And it's important that we place disability within that context, as opposed to getting into incredibly complex inf information that at times just leads to disengagement. And I think that's just a, a reflection that I would bring to, to the discussion today. And um, I mentioned data. So for World Autism Month every year, we do two exercises, and I think they really uh, shed a light on some of these topics. First of all, we do an attitudes to autism poll. That is where we poll a representative sample of 1,000 Irish adults on their attitudes to autism. And we do a same chance report, which is really a state of the community survey of the autism community. And this year, 1,603 autistic people are represented within the report. In terms of the attitudes to autism survey, there's some very interesting findings. 80% of people now say that they're aware of autism as a clinical condition. 46% of people say they have a family member who's autistic, either someone in their immediate family or in their broader family circle. More than half say they know somebody who is autistic. What, what is very clear from our findings is the way people learn is key, and this comes back to autistic voice. When asked to associate um, particular traits or characteristics to autism, those who say they know someone who is autistic are much more likely to point to positive attributes, whereas those who do not or do not claim to know someone who is autistic are much more likely to point to stereotypes or negative attributes. Concerningly, 20% of people, just shy of 20% of people, still think that the most reliable source of information on autism is from the media or social media and the experiences of our community. That is very much not the case. Also of concern, uh, the general public continues to rank relevant professionals as a more reliable source of information on autism than on autistic people ourselves. What is really positive to see is that across all areas and questions, the 18 to 25 year old category have very progressive attitudes. And I think that shows the broader benefits of inclusive education for society where people are growing up and seeing autism and disability more generally as a normal part of diversity based on their experiences within school. Interestingly, the, the Irish public overwhelmingly recognise the barriers that autistic people face, perhaps don't always understand their own roles within those barriers. And indeed, there is a distinct difference between what the Irish public report and indeed what our community experience on a day-to-day -day basis. In our same chance report, 90% of autistic people said they didn't believe people in their community understood enough about autism. 38% reported that they had experienced discrimination in the per previous 12 months 
on the grounds of being autistic. 91% said being autistic was a barrier to gaining acceptance and friendship. 84% did not feel social gatherings or occasions uh, were made accessible or, or, or were open to them as autistic people. 68% felt autistic people were treated negatively in a, differently in a negative way by Irish society. And 83% of people said they believed that they had to mask their autism or hide the fact that they were autistic to gain acceptance within the community. This really does show that while awareness is there and we have very clear evidence, if we had asked questions about autism even five years ago, we wouldn't have had that sort of trend in terms of people saying they know autistic people, hearing about autism, but it doesn't mean behaviour is changing. And that's where we have a significant role and piece of work to do. Article 8 of the UNCRPD calls out a number of things specifically that I just want to speak to briefly. One is the area of family life. And I think it is important that we see that as the starting point of appropriate understanding of disability. And as I am, we run an empower and educate program for family members of recently diagnosed children, because very often people don't have that knowledge and that's where problems can emerge. Indeed, in the same chance support, 57% of people said that they didn't feel they received the level of support or understanding they needed from their broader family circle. As I mentioned, I think autistic voice is absolutely essential in all awareness raising activities and disabled voice. But I think it's really important for us as a community to create a space and opportunities for those conversations to take place. I am concerned that sometimes people, because they aren't sure about language or terminology, simply disengage. And we need to proactively create, create spaces in which people can have these conversations uh, with confidence. What I am concerned about awareness raising is that it consistently can lead to increased stereotypes. And in a community like the disability community, I think it's particularly important that we highlight intersectional and lesser heard voices within our own communities. I also think that it's very important we start in a small way around the language that we use. Um, and I think the, the state has an important role to play in this with men with disability and autism, still referred to often very inappropriately in official state documents. And this in and of itself can lead to stereotypes and stigma. What I wanted to conclude on was just pointing, I suppose, to some of the specific areas Article 8 points to. It talks about education. And I think in terms of awareness raising, there is no more urgent area than increasing understanding of autism and disability within schools. It's concerning that mandatory training for teachers is still not a reality. And that whilst we have become much more confident about talking about lots of forms of diversity in schools, we still seem to shy away from disability and as a result in only further deepened stigma. Within media, there is a significant role of work to be done around improving the language and how disability is portrayed by national media. And I think it is important to say that the state does have a significant role in this, where also these are, are forced to share very, very personal and sometimes, um, I suppose, insensitive content within the national media cause of failures and services, and that is placing disability and disabled people in a completely unacceptable uh, scenario. I suppose what I wanted to finish on, I, I did just want to briefly touch on employment and say within our same chance report, we have also published our autism in the workplace report. And really at the heart of many of the barriers autistic people are facing when it comes to work is a lack of knowledge amongst employers, a desire to learn and a lack of knowledge. So there is an urgent need to act in the organization. But what I wanted to just conclude on was to say, I suppose, that when we talk about awareness raising, we sometimes make assumptions about what people need to know. And I suppose I just wanted to conclude with a couple of quotes from the same chance report. When we asked members of our community, what did you wish other people knew about autism? And they said, be our friend, our partner. Do not walk through us like we don't exist. Stop, stop treating us like we are invisible. They said, it's not something to be wary of, just allow us to be us. I wish they knew how difficult tasks are with going to the shop, finding a school place, participating in a community activity like sport. Just because I excel in work doesn't mean I don't need supports in other areas of my life. It isn't like the awful stereotypes on TV. That's far from being unable to feel empathy. We're often overly empathetic to an extent that it can be overwhelming. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the questions and answer session.
Thank you very much, Adam, for those perspectives and also for keeping so brilliantly to time. I uh, really loved the point you made there at the start. Awareness is a starting point, not a destination. So just a reminder that if you have questions and answers, or sorry, questions for any of our speakers, put them in the question and answer uh, box uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible at the end of this particular session. But for now, I'm going to pass directly on to Paula Sarahan of the Independent Living Movement Ireland, who's going to offer her perspectives on the theme. Over to you, Paula. Thank you, Aideen. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. It's lovely to be here today. And um, thank you very much, Adam, for your, your input. It was very insightful. I am just going to share a brief presentation, a few slides that I've put together for today. Um, so just as, as we all know, talk today um, or this event is around Article 8 of the UNCRPD awareness raising. And I'm going to particularly focus on the um, team of disability equality um, to this particular uh, area of the UNCRPD. And um, my name is Paula Sorhin, and I am a proud disabled woman who works for Independent Living Movement Ireland. And there are my um, contact details if anyone wants to get in touch. So first of all, what I'll cover today. So to start, some statistics and realities of being a disabled person in Ireland. Uh, next, what a disabled person Persons Organisation or DPO is. Um, next, the importance of the lived experience of disability. And finally, the importance of disability equality training led by disabled people. So some statistics or realities. So there are approximately 1,400 to 1,600 disabled people under the age of 65 living in nursing homes. And as we all know, um, this is really, really unacceptable and it really needs to change. It means that people aren't re they're not realizing their full potential. They don't get to live lives of their choice. And disabled people also have no right to a personal assistance service, for example. And I and I, um, over the last year or so, we actually launched quite a big campaign, the Paths Now campaign, to highlight these issues that personal assistance isn't a right and it's not written into law and it's very much done on a piecemeal basis. And it's basically like a post postcode lottery that is based on largely where you live and how you can advocate for yourself that it's not a right that anyone that needs a personal assistance service unfortunately does not have one and disabled people also don't have a right to peer support or mentoring and many disabled people also don't have the right to accessible transport or the built environment and that can also affect our day-to-day -day lives and our chances with employment with travel and, um, you know, with the social aspect of things and just really living a full and fruitful life. And disabled people also do not have the right to universally design homes or communities. So there's many barriers in disabled people's lives. Next, what is a DPO? So a DPO is an organization that is led, directed and governed by disabled people. And they are run by disabled people for disabled people. And they're really focused on disability rights and equality and challenging the um, ignorance and ableist attitudes and barriers that exist in society and really removing them. And we're really passionate in ILMI, for example, around removing um, the barriers that disabled people face and making rights real so that every disabled person in Ireland lives a life of their choosing and has equal opportunity. And there's also the effective and meaningful participation of disabled people and that's really integral to the UNCRPD. And all government policies and strategies require meaningful consultation with DPOs. So it goes beyond, as Adam said, the tick the box exercise that it doesn't just stop a consultation, but that's the beginning, but it's not the end point. Next, the importance of the lived experience. So disabled people are the experts in their own lives. And they really need to be given the opportunity to have the space to share their experiences and really have their voices heard in an authentic way. And the social model of disability is really key in disabled people being aware of the barriers they face. And while working collectively in a DPO can change this, because really there still very much is the dominant um, belief 
that disability is a deficit, that it's something that a person has, and that, it, you know, if you have a disability, for example, that something is wrong with you. And we're very passionate in ILMI that disability is not something that a person has, but it's something that is done externally to a person with an impairment label. For example, the label of cerebral palsy or autism, for example. So really empowering disabled people with the knowledge of the social model is really key in being aware of the barriers they face. And by working collectively, working together in a DPO can change this. So again, it's about shifting the uh, lens from as a, an individual disabled person feeling like the reason why you're facing so many barriers is because of your impairment or because of your condition and feeling that you have to put up with things as they are or feeling like if you're coming up against a barrier or an access, an access issue, you have to fight it alone. So it's really moving from the individual to the collective and there's a lot of empowerment in that. And awareness raising can really only be done by disabled people with lived experience. And what I mean by that is that, again, like Adam said, it's genuine awareness raising and genuine understanding, you know, because society, larger society are very aware that disabled people exist, but there's not a deep understanding of the barriers that we face and the intricacies of that, and that actually being disabled is very much a political issue. So we're slowly but surely making steps to um, make that a reality. There's been a lot of work that's been done, but we've a long way to go. And it's really about challenging unconscious bias. So the likes of stereotypes, prejudice, that if somebody has, you know, a certain impairment or talks a certain way or walks a certain way or might communicate differently, that we're really challenging why we might view them as less than or less capable or, you know, quote unquote, not normal. And really to challenge that and make society inclusive for everyone. And to really build capacity for disabled people to raise their expectations so that they can reach their full potential. Because for many disabled people at this moment in time in society and in the past, because of their impairment label and their diagnosis, that's been how many disabled people have lived their lives through that lens. And they've been made feel that because of their diagnosis or condition, that they can't do certain things or they're not able to do certain things. So they have very low expectations expectations within themselves and they don't really get to live um, fruitful or um, full or valuable lives in society. So we're really about challenging that in ILMI and really raising people's expectations and building their capacity that everyone deserves to live their lives as they choose and make decisions that affect their lives. And that would look different for everybody, but it's really about you know letting people know that everyone has autonomy and deserves autonomy and to make rights real. And also on the intersectionality aspect of it as well, that disabled people are more than their impairment label and belong to every group in society. So for example, you could have a disabled woman who is a member of the LGBTQ community, disabled black people exist, disabled people of color. Um, you know, we belong to every aspect and we can have multiple um, identities, um, marginalized or otherwise. So for example, disabled people are um, friends, they can be mothers, they can be parents, they can be spouses, um, we can be employers, employees, and um, you know, it's, it's looking at the disabled person as the whole individual and being respectful of their experiences that their impairment might bring with them, but not letting that overshadow it and making sure that everyone has reasonable accommodations and can live their life to the fullest with the supports that they need. And then just one last slide, the importance of disability equality training. So that must be delivered by a disabled person who is informed by the social model of disability um, and or a disabled person's organisation. So it's really about getting into the, the kind of nitty gritty of it and, you know, for example, delivering it in schools and um, among teachers and staff to kind of educate people that we're moving from disability awareness which sees disability as a personal issue. It's very much focusing on the impairment and the supposed limitations of that impairment. And it kind of can view the disabled person as inferior, even though that's not the intended purpose. So it's about moving away from disability awareness and very much focusing on disability equality. And we're really about challenging the unacceptable medical and charity model of disability. 
And that model basically says that um, the disabled person has something wrong with them because of their impairment label, that they can't do X, Y, and Z. And, um, you know, this supposed um, perceived view of independence and that independence means doing everything by yourself, for yourself, and that's the best possible outcome. But the reality is that each and every one of us are interdependent and we rely on other people and connections to um, live our lives the way that we live them. And it's really about seeing disability as a, um, as a social status and as a political issue. And it's really about focusing on agency. So this is about discovery, capacity and control over one's life. And it involves having options and making informed choices. It's also about social justice. So this is about making rights real and making a more equal distribution of resources. It's about dismantling structural ableism and embedding the social model of disability in policy thinking, policy making and policy implementation. It's also about, about collective empowerment, so working together collectively to bring about positive, tangible social change. And Article 8 of the UNCRPD at its core is about disability equality. So thank you very much for listening to my input today, and I really look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, a huge amount of food for thought there, and I'm sure some of those themes will be picked up in the breakout sessions. Um, but we do have a few minutes now for some questions. Um, and a reminder, uh, still plenty of time to get them into the Q&A box. Um, I'll kick off by reading one we have there. Um, it suggests it might uh, be coming, uh, might be most directed at yourself, Adam, but uh, I'll start with you anyway. So the person asks, the language around neuroaffirmative approaches is becoming more prominent to counteract the approaches that aim to make autistic people appear more neurotypical. How easy is it to make this change? I think it's challenging in truth. And I think it, it's, it's a broad area of language shift, I think. So, you know, it's really trying to get away from the language of disorder and towards the language of difference. And um, I think there's some things that require explanation. So, for example, I think a particular difference within the autistic community is the preference to be called an autistic person as opposed to a person with autism. And we saw in the government's recent consultation uh, paper on the autism empowerment strategy, that that is now coming to across as a clear preference within the autistic adult community. So we have that evidence base. I think for the most part, when people are given the information, they are happy to go along with it. I think it's not something that people innately know in most instances. And um, what I think is frustrating is when people uh, are given the information and continue to battle with it. And I think that's where there is just, it comes, I think at that stage, really an issue of respect. I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about people uh, not knowing but actually people adamant will know I want to use the language of disorder for example so that is that is quite frustrating I think the state has an awful lot of work to do here and to just give you one very simple example um when Minister Joe McHugh was the Minister for Education he gave a very helpful speech in the doll around the need to change the language around autism but unfortunately we've seen the Department of Education slide totally back into using inappropriate language including the actual technical name for autism autism spectrum disorder so if our starting point is to describe someone as being disordered, we're not going to do a very good job in shifting attitudes. Sometimes I think um, the, neuro, the lack of language that is neuroaffirmative can be unintended. And I think the classic example is that we've let the word unit slide into our vernacular. Uh, it was never the intention of the Department of Education to call autism classes units. I believe it was some technical word about buildings that just slipped into the vernacular, but it shows the underlying thinking that people have when they see that word that they think clinically immediately. But it just shows how we really have to think through the language that we use, because unfortunately the language we use does inform the world that we live in. Great, thank you so much, Adam. Um, Paula, could I ask a question in relation to what you were uh, talking about, about DPOs developing and delivering disability equality training? For um, any organizations who are out there looking to kind of avail of some of this training, are you advising that they go DPO by DPO or is there a kind of a collective uh, approach 
Um, because I'm conscious there'd be lots of, you know, Adam's been talking about the autistic side of things, but there, you know, there would be other impairments or other disabilities that would have different focus or, or, or different requirements. So, so what's your best advice there? So, for example, thank you for your, your question, Aileen. I think that's a very good question. So, um, ILMI is actually cross impairment, so we don't focus on one particular impairment, so we're across the board. Um, and we would have many different members with many different impairments um, you know, that would um, get involved with us. So, for example, um, ILMI are very passionate around disability equality training. And I suppose it would be the likes of ILMI that would be um, more than welcome to engage with different organisations to deliver the specific training. Um, I know that there can be some confusion around you know, what a DPO actually is, but I think for example, I know as I am that, you know, Adam, yourself, you're, you're a DPO, for example. Um, but I think there can be kind of a, a, a kind of um, a tendency aiding for other organizations to call themselves DPOs and kind of encroach on our work and kind of take our language. Um, and then maybe um, because of resources, opportunities that are taken from genuine DPOs like ourselves. Um, so I think that needs to be, to be made very clear. And just because this particular lunchtime talk is around the UNCRPD, I think when that does happen, it needs to be referenced the UNCRPD about what a DPO actually is, um, so that the opportunities to deliver disability equality training, you know, that they are given to the genuine DPOs who actually know and understand what disability equality training is. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there's a couple of questions in here, um, again, for yourself, Adam, one is, is uh, you'll be able to give a specific answer to, and one then I think is, is probably more wide ranging, but I'll put them both at once. So the first one is, uh, you know, are, are your statistics changing over time? You, you, you mentioned your, your attitudes to autism report. Have you seen a positive trajectory since you started doing that study? Uh, and then I suppose the more uh, gener general one, uh, the $60 million one is, how do you think negative attitudes around autistic people can be changed? Thank you so much. In terms of the statistics, overall, we are seeing positive uh, shift in many areas. We do this study year on year and it's our third one. So obviously the reality is we need to do it over a number of further years to, I can see a very clear pattern. Um, we're definitely seeing year on year an increase in terms of that very generic awareness. In terms of the behavior based questions, change is slower and there isn't always a clear pattern. So I think, you know, it's a mixed picture. Uh, but I would say that I think what we can see on the ground is that knowledge is, in is increasing. There's an appetite to learn, but it doesn't mean people's behaviors are changing. So I think what we're seeing is probably would concur with the, the research that the National Disability Authority has done that was alluded to at the start um, as well. I think in terms of the million dollar question, um, I wish I knew the answer. And I suspect that I think the reality from the work that we're doing is there isn't one answer to this. There's no one action or intervention that is going to change this. We need a very joined up whole of society approach. And what we fundamentally need is a culture shift. I do think there's a couple of essential ingredients to that. I think one essential ingredient is representation really matters. And I think we see again and again and again when autistic people in front and centre sharing their experiences, that's where people move beyond the stereotypes. And again, we saw that statistically in our attitudes to autism. So when someone knew they were autistic, someone who was autistic, they were more likely to say loyalty, honesty, attention. If they knew somebody, uh, if they didn't know someone who was autistic, they were more likely to say things like violence or uh, like not, things that might be perceived as not positive, like not making eye contact. So I, I think as a, as a result, a piece of autistic voice is critical. I also think that we have work to do as well in breaking stereotypes. Uh, if, we, if I just take the autism community, the, the research underpinning our community was all carried out on white middle class boys in the 1940s. And we're only getting away from that now. So if we want to shift stereotypes, we need to make sure in our communications that we are being representative. I think in particular, of, for example, autistic women, I think in particular, for example, of autistic people who are also members of the traveller community. So I think there's significant work to be done there. I do think media and social media has an important role to play. And I've seen some really positive activism, for example, take place on platforms like TikTok, which is really exciting because I think it can give a depth and a, 
nuance sometimes in, in, in the amount of content that you can produce that you can get across in an article or even in a, a TV program. What I think popular culture can do for us is really important in terms of if at the minute, if, if there's an autistic character, the reason a person's in the program is because they are autistic. And very often they're written in a very stereotypical way without consulting with the community. And I think about how other minority groups are portrayed on screen. 10 years ago, if you saw if someone was in a soap opera and they were gay, the reason they were in the soap opera was probably their sexuality. We're now seeing representations where somebody's the local, the local lawyer or the local doctor, and they just happen to be gay. And we need to get to the point where autism and disability is shown as just a normal part of diversity, not something that necessarily has to drive the plot or it would be a source of tragedy within a plot, for example. Well, for me, I think education is key. And I think a good place to start in improving lives and shifting attitudes is mandatory training for public services in the area of autism and disability. Thank you, uh, Adam. L lots of suggestions we, we could follow through on there. Um, Paula, I'll, I'll come back to you um, with a, a, a specific question, I suppose, about um, ILMI and, and how are you organizing in the community? Um, this person is asking, uh, is recruitment going well? Is spreading the knowledge of the ILMI going well? Or are there particular hurdles you're facing? Well, thank you very much for that question. And as I say, we would have an active presence here, for example, on social media. And we're always, you know, trying to get more visibility and be out, of, be out as much as possible, um, you know, to show visibility to other disabled people and really break down barriers and really break down stereotypes. And our membership is growing, which is fantastic. There can still be a gap. Um, I did see a previous question, uh, Adrian, that I, I think I'll bring into this mm -hmm. around that a lot of people don't really know what a DPO is still. And that is a hurdle. And that is one that we do, we're continuing to work to basically um, break down. Um, because a lot of people, when they think of disability, they don't think of, of DPOs. And that is a huge issue. And that can then feed into um, basically the medical model. They don't think about the social model. People don't know what the social model is. They don't understand it. Um, I think they can find the whole idea of DPOs um, quite challenging, maybe when they, when they first come across it. Um, when they hear of activism, for example, people have a certain idea of what activism is that it could be chaining yourself to a bus or you're constantly protesting. And I think that that can put people off. But um, just to reassure people that that's not what ILMI is, is about, that can be fantastic, you know, if, if that's what other people want to do. But us in ILMI, with our activism, we're very much um, coming together collectively to influence policy and structures to bring about tangible social change. And we're constantly... Um, always you know working to bring new people into the movement and um, for example my colleague Shani Gaynor was um, at a talk last week around assistive um, technology and um, I spoke at the SBHI conference in, in Dundalk last weekend and um, you know we present at different conferences and um, we present at the Iraq this, for example and we'd have different um, workshops locally and nationally that were, were on the ground, there were grassroots organisations. So we're constantly always out and about or online, engaging with new people and current members to really get our message across and to really um, build up people's capacity and, and knowledge about what a DPO is and why it's so important. Um, and I think it, that's very important that we need to, to let people know um, I think specifically younger people as well as older people, we don't have, our membership is open from people that are age 16 and up. But I think going back to what we discussed earlier, myself and Adam, in, in both of our inputs around education, and that it needs to happen as early as possible. Um, because you do have people, for example, that they might not attend a, a service. They could be a disabled person. They might not attend a service. They might have been mainstreamed in school. But they won't have any connections with other disabled people, so they will have internalized a lot of the issues and the stereotypes around disability and, and themselves, and they won't want to be associated with disabled people. But if they knew what a DPO was and the importance of a DPO, well, then that would bridge that gap. And um, 
but yes, we're constantly um, growing our membership and engaging with um, people locally and nationally to really raise our profile and um, let people understand that the work that we do is very, very important and it's challenging, but it's, it's worthwhile. Absolutely. Thanks, Paula. And, and you mentioned um, education there and, and both of you have been speaking about it. And there's another question in there that it's for both of you um, and suggesting, you know, the need for mandatory training for teachers so that the education system can play its part in changing attitudes. And so I suppose for each of you, do you have a view on whether in addition to training, do we need to be able to think about ways of ensuring we have more disabled teachers and, and what would be involved in that? So uh, I'll go to yourself first, Adam, on that and then Paula. Totally. And I think it's a it's a straightforward question, because I think even disability aside, we know that one of the problems we have is our teaching profession really doesn't represent society as a whole. And, um, you know, it is it is very uh, homogenous cohort of people stereotypically involved in teaching. And I think we need a much more diverse cohort of teachers to reflect Irish society in the 21st century. And disabled people are, are just another aspect to that, in my view. I think if there's nothing sure, nothing clearer for me that if you're a, a young person, who is autistic, being able to see other people in important roles in the community has a really important part to play. You know, to be it, I have to see it. And I think as well as that, there's no question that, you know, having an autistic insight uh, can have a huge, a hugely positive impact even on other teachers' practices. Having that perspective in the staff room, I think, can be really, really important. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we do need to look at, education is just one example of this, I think, unfortunately, we, we've always known that there's a significant cohort of autistic people attracted to teaching, for example. Um, we've, we've, there's just been a book published about it this year by Dr. Rebecca Wood. Autistic teachers have always existed. But in certain professions, the legal profession is another example. The medicine, medical profession is another example. There can be an increased stigma uh, if you have a disability. People can be even more reluctant to share. And very quickly, people can start making assumptions or assertions about competence owing to the fact that you are disabled. So there is a, an industry specific stigma that we need to address as well. OK, thanks, Adam. Um, Paula, your thoughts on um, disabled teachers? Yeah, just as I say, I completely agree as well. And Isla and I are very passionate about that also on representation. And, you know, to say as well that, I mean, we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go, that it really should be that disabled people are just seen as, as another slice of life and not a worst case scenario, not a, not a personal tragedy. And I have huge respect for the teaching profession. I know that it's extremely challenging and very stressful and they have a lot of, you know, work to do in their in their day to day lives and their day to day roles. And oftentimes a lot of people aren't supported um, to, within that career. And, and that is a challenge. But I think going back to the disability equality training, and um, that is key and that should be implemented at the very beginning so that it's just built into their toolkit that they don't feel that they have to have all the answers on their own because nobody can have all the answers you know you don't know what you don't know and but the disability equality training with that being delivered at the outset by a disabled person from a dpo that will bring about change slowly but surely, and then that will have a knock-on effect with how disabled um, students are treated in the classroom and their outcomes and the understandings of their supports and the reasonable accommodations. And then that will have a knock-on effect about how they see themselves and how they feel, you know, in relation to confidence and self-esteem, and then maybe what they want to do for a career that they'll feel and they realize that they have a lot more potential. And then we'll start to see more visibility, more teachers um, who are disabled, more principals, more disabled people basically everywhere that you don't feel, for example, because you have a mobility um, issue that you have to have a sit down job because you feel that you can't do X, Y, and Z because you're not able to walk a long distance every day, for example. And I know that that might sound a bit trivial, but it's those kind of things that can really get in on disabled people and can really have an effect. And I think as well, I, I do kind of have a bit of an issue around the word inclusion. I think sometimes that that's used as a bit of a buzzword, to be honest. But in schools, if this approach was taken, and I do strongly believe that it does need to be taken for everybody and that we just understand and respect that everybody, you know, everyone's needs and, you know, to be equitable and 
So basically, um, sorry, now I've, I've briefly lost my train of thought, but basically that it's genuine inclusion and that nobody is segregated or treated unfavor unfavorably or treated differently because they have an impairment label, but that they're, they're valued and treated um, as, as a valuable member of society. Okay, thank you. Um, very uh, important goal there. And uh, we'll just have time for one more question before we go to a break. Um, so again, it's a question for, for both our speakers. And really, I suppose it's to kind of sum up uh, very nicely the session. What do you feel have been the biggest breakthroughs in terms of disability awareness um, building or disability equality uh, in recent years? Um, so Paula, will we go to you first this time? Thank you, Aideen. I think that, you know, that there's been more of an understanding of DPOs that they've been recently established and that disabled people more and more are realizing that we have rights and we deserve our rights and to live full lives and equal lives. And I think as well, social media has played a big part in that too, that it's given a platform to people whose voices that we may not have otherwise heard. I know that it can be a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes, but I do believe that it does have many positives as well. And we've seen, for example, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic that reasonable accommodations, they can be put in place you know, when push comes to shove. So I think that that certainly does need to continue. And as I say, the recent establishment of um, DPOs has been fantastic, but we need to be properly funded and properly resourced so that we basically can continue to have our voices heard and that tangible social, tangible social change can continue to happen because more often than not, we are spoken for by um, non-disabled people, and that can feed into the overwhelming narrative that we're to be pitied, we're to be cared for, or we're to be feared, uh, or that we're a threat because we're violent, depending on our um, perceived impairment label. So I, I definitely do think that that is a, a positive, that that is being challenged more and more, and that we are slowly but surely starting to see more um, visibility. Thanks, Paula. And same question to you, Adam. What have you seen as a breakthrough over the time you've been working on it? Another sixty million uh, dollar question. <laughs> I, I, I think <laughs> <laughs> when I went and uh, when I went and read the question, I think actually one would say is the level of awareness again, and obviously with all the caveats that we've made, that the, that it doesn't mean that there's understanding, it doesn't mean that there's acceptance. But certainly what I think we've seen in recent years is an overwhelming increase in an awareness of disability. I think that is very clear on the ground. And, you know, I think for me, the stat that really stood out um, when I think about my experiences growing up versus the world that we live in today, from the same chance report, the idea that 46% of people, so nearly half the population, now say that they have a family member who is autistic, be that an immediate family member or someone in their broader family circle. And just that level of representation is moving autism from something that was seen as kind of very rare to the reality that it is a day to day part of people's lives. So I think that has been very, very important. I, I would concur with Paula. I think what has been important as well has been we are seeing that shift around disabled people being in the room, disabled people being on the airwaves. And that in and of itself, I think, has been has been fundamental um, and linked to that, the diversity of voices within that. Um, I mean, you know, it's not that long ago when people were talking about autism as the extreme male brain and that it was something that was really only experienced by boys. Now we're seeing autistic women, we're seeing people from um, all intersectional communities coming forward. And I think to, to maybe finish on a positive note, something that I've seen in recent years that I think is really exciting me is I can't get over, well, there's still a huge stigma and all of that. I, I can't get over when I go around the country and I visit schools now confidence of young people growing up now with disabilities there has been a shift in that regard as well I'm meeting more and more 14 15 16 year olds who are proud of the fact that they're autistic who want to talk about it who want to meet other autistic people not to say that there's many more who still feel very stigmatized but I am seeing a, a confident regeneration emerge and I think that's very exciting as well from an awareness raising perspective brilliant Thank you so much. It is good to end on a positive note, but I think a common theme is a, a, a lot done, uh, a lot more to do, uh, and both your organisations are obviously um, playing a crucial part in that. 
Um, I'm sorry we didn't get time to get through any more questions, but we do need to allow a bit of a break before we go into the breakthrough sessions. So at this stage, I will just thank Paula and Adam again very much for um, the, the generosity of their, their time and their inputs. And what we're going to do now is, is take a 10 minute break. And then when you're ready to come back at 1.35, the idea is that you click on the second Zoom link that you received and you'll be allocated to a breakout room. And in that breakout room, there'll be a facilitator and a note taker for the discussion. Uh, and at that stage, if you want to see everybody in your group, you might need to change your view to, to gallery view. So you'll be put straight in there. That's why I'm giving you these instructions now before your break, because uh, you won't see me again until the end at, at 2.30, when we'll all be brought back into this single room and, and we'll hear a, a little summary from how the discussion went in each of the groups. So listen, a very warm thanks again to Adam Harris of As I Am and Paula Sarahan of the Independent Living Movement, and we'll reconvene in our breakout groups at 1.35. Thank you. <laughs>